Today is July 25th, 2013 at about 2.30. 2.45 and we're sitting with Frank and Carrie. Yeah, so to start off, if you don't mind talking about just where you're from originally, we can go from there. Oh. Hi, my name's Frank Moe. I'm originally from Spokane, Washington. Met my wife in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We lived in various states and work brought us to um, Craig about 25 years ago. I came to manage the Holiday Inn in Craig, Colorado. Okay. Hmm. And I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. Like Frank said, we met out in Indiana. We, did, we moved a few times and came out here and just fell in love with the area and decided to stay. And, and uh, we had the opportunity to get into business for ourselves. And, and We've been here ever since. Okay. So we've been here since November of 1987. November of 1987. So you both came after the boom. Then. Yes. yes. Uh, a while after the boom. When we were moving in, I think everybody else was moving out of town. Okay. <laughs> it was okay. very deserted. It was uh, lots of empty houses everywhere. Okay. Yeah, the so business cool. district was um, gloomy and, you know, and that. I mean, the people were very positive, but we were just surprised, you know, when we first, you know, moved here, and it's, not to get ahead of ourselves, but it's just been an exciting transition of how much improvement, you know, that there has been. Okay. Okay. Um, so you said you came here to manage the Holiday Inn yes. at first. What what was that like? When you um, it was really interesting because I had managed um, Sheraton Hotels in Texas, and because of the banking crisis, I can't remember what year that was, everybody was losing their hotels to the bank, and we came here at the time Public Employees Retirement Association owned the Holiday Inn, and they had billions of dollars, so it was like there was some good job security. We worked for a management company that managed the hotel um, for Para. Okay. Because we had been in the South for several years, and each owner that Frank had worked for when they had like 10, 15 hotels each, but they had gone through the federal savings and loan, and when that kind of went belly up in the late 80s, uh, a lot of the owners that we knew, they were losing, you know, 10, 15 properties just like that, mm -hmm. and we wanted to get out of there before the property Frank was managing went under, and when we checked out Para and saw that they had a pretty good balance sheet, we figured they were stable enough company to come up here for, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's kind of what got us to this part of the world, and I always wanted to live in Colorado anyway. Okay. I thought it would be very nice, very pretty, and I love mm -hmm. snow, so. How did you find the opening uh, at Craig specifically? Um, a friend of mine, the same management company, managed three properties for Para here. It was a Hilton in Grand Junction, Colorado, and then it was the Snowmass Resort in um, Snowmass. So this one Wildwood. management, yeah. Well, yeah, it was called Wildwood. They managed the hotels for Para, and he knew I was looking for a job and, you know, and said, come for an interview. Okay. Okay. Um, what were your first impressions then of the town outside of if just looking at business or people moving in and out? What else did the town look like? <laughs> it's funny. It took us five days to get here because we went through the worst snowstorms you possibly could imagine. We made it wow. from... We were coming up from Texas, and we spent uh, one night in the Dallas-Fort Worth area because I had family down there, and that's where I'm originally from anyway. And we made it to Wichita Falls, Texas, and then uh, the next day we, w we stopped in Colorado Springs, and the weather had been beautiful and very nice. This was late November. And uh, the next day we saw something about a snowstorm, but since we didn't know the area, you know, we looked outside, everything <laughs> looked great, we thought we were fine. And as we went, we made it from Colorado Springs to Monument. That's as far as we got Which before. Is how many miles? I think it's maybe twenty miles uh, or something. I, I can't mm. even remember how far it is. It's not very far. We hadn't been on the road very long at all. We had two sports cars and no snow tires. And this blizzard just came out of nowhere. And uh, uh, we ended up going, or I ended up going off the road uh, right there in Monument. Uh, a semi had passed me, and he was going so fast, and I was in this little two-seater. And the section from the semi just pulled me right out of my lane without snow tires. I ended up doing a 180 on the interstate. And we actually were very fortunate because we pulled off right there at the Falcon Inn. And right ahead of us, and we didn't even know it at the time, was a 20-car pileup. So we really had many blessings that day. 
And uh, so the next day, six no tires later, <laughs> we ventured out. We made it as far as Denver, and then we still had to stop because of the snow. And then the next day, we made it as far as Empire, and we had to again stop because of the snow. It was just so bad. And then finally, from Empire, we made it all the way to Craig. And one of the things that had really attracted me about Colorado is when I was a kid I lived in Switzerland and I just had this image of Switzerland in my head that I just thought Colorado would look like that and from basically from Monument all the way through Empire it was just gorgeous, beautiful, you know, pure champagne powder or whatever, it's just as pretty as it could be. And so I had this image in my head that Craig was going to look like that too. And you know, we go through all these ski resorts <laughs> getting here and all this snow and by the time we went all the way through 70 to Rifle and came up that way because everyone in M Empire was telling us, don't go over Berthoud Pass. Whatever you do, if you're new to the area, don't drive over Berthoud Pass. Right. And so we're coming up from Rifle. And by the time we pass Meeker, there's no more snow. And it's just, everything's dormant. And it's very brown, very dark. <laughs> yeah. Now I get to Craig, and we had had walkie-talkies. I mean, it tells you how old it is. We weren't cell phones back then because this was late 80s. Mm. And we were on walkie-talkies. And, you know, this whole trip here, Driving up from Texas, we'd go through these little towns, and I'd call Frank on the walkie-talkie and say, oh, does Craig look like this? He's like, well, no, not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> as we're coming into Craig, and I love it here. I'm obviously, we've been here 25 years, but as we were coming down Highway 13, I said, this isn't it, is it? <laughs> He's like, yes, it is. Uh -huh. But there was no snow, and it, uh, it was in that transitional phase that sometimes happens here where it was a lot of mud, a lot of dirt, nothing was growing, nothing was green. There was no snow yet here. What we had, you know, would come and go within a day, and it was just a very stark contrast to all of Colorado that we had seen up to that point. Mm -hmm. That I was actually quite shocked because, again, I had had this image of, you know, ski resort in my head or Switzerland when I was a kid. But like she said, we'd uh, never live anywhere else. Yeah, we've I mean, been we, here 25 years, but yeah, we're it dug in pretty It wasn't good. what. She it thought. just wasn't what we thought, and you know, having lived in larger towns, even though I'd lived in a smaller town than this when I was younger. It had been a while to be in such a small area, but I wouldn't trade it for anything now. It's fun to go to the big city and visit, and we have all of our family are in big cities, but we can't wait to get out of there and get home. And the community <laughs> isn't what it looks like. It's made up of yeah. all of the people, yeah, so all the people. that's why we love it so much. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this is, you get a very strong sense of community in Craig, which I think is just wonderful. I don't know if you get that in Long Beach. or When I had a brother that lived in... Southern California around Anaheim and when he had come out to visit he did not know what a jet contrail was mm -hmm. and he had not seen those stripes in the sky and he kept saying what are those stripes up in the sky I'm like you're kidding oh. you don't know what those are he goes no you don't see those in Anaheim yeah and so he explained what they were and then at night he had never seen the Milky Way because again you know being in the big city I'm sure you guys know that mm -hmm. with all those city lights you can't see yeah. stars the way you can here and every time we've had family come visit I mean they're just they're almost speechless because they, they just haven't experienced the kind of things out here that we have that we won't trade for anything now. But We're uh, we're both military brats, so uh -huh. we've kind of lived everywhere. And where we came from before Long Beach, 29 Palms is a small military base in the desert in California. It's much like Craig. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously the climate's a little different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very much like it, and I, I do understand what you're saying. Um, how did you then transition? from managing the Holiday Inn into owning your own business? Actually, it was interesting. How many years did I manage it? Till we six years. For six years, managed it. The last two years, Para wanted to sell the hotel, so it changed owners um, twice that I worked for um, different ownership. And then we went, we've been here so long, let's get into business for ourselves. So. The Colorado Inn in downtown Craig was for sale, even though it was a small mom and pop property. We went, there's our opportunity to get into business for ourselves. So I gave notice at the hotel. We um, actually did a lease purchase because we didn't have that much um, cash, and the people that owned it were very cooperative because they wanted to get out of the business, so they leased it to us. And then what was it? Was it less than a year when we bought it? Was it was less than a year. We actually put our house up for sale and figured whenever we sold our house, that would be our cash for a down payment. But when we got into the hotel and started running it, it was so easy to fix it up and make it do well that we were able to generate enough cash within a year to come up with a down payment without having to sell our house. So we ended up renting our house out, and so we only lived on property of this little property. Or we lived on 
property at the Colorado Inn for a year, and then after that we moved back to our house. Mm -hmm. But we did well enough with that little property to generate enough cash to come mm -hmm. up with the down payment. And the people that we had done the lease option for, they just, they wanted out. They didn't know anything about the hotel or motel business, and they they just needed to get it off their hands. Mm -hmm. So it was a fun way for us to get started, and we did, in fact, so well with that property that that's what enabled us to build the hotel that we have now, because mm -hmm. we designed and built that from the ground up. And, oh. and, uh, it, and that was all through being successful with the little mom and pa downtown that we sold back in, I guess it was 2004. Yeah, we built up enough equity in that to build the um, Best Western. Wow. So what what is that process like building that new franchise business here in in Craig? Well, in small community? kind of reflect back, um, there's a well-known attorney in town, Rod Peck, and he was our personal attorney and business attorney so he helped um, us with walking us through the different steps of, you know, doing loans, financing, and all of um, that. And it was a big um, process to do for us being new in the ownership side of the business. But years later, was it five or six years well, later, we, yeah. we had a meeting in his office and we were just talking. And he goes, I still don't believe that you guys were able to do it. He goes, even though I was helping you, I thought that it was never going to um, happen, and we went, neither did we. How did it actually happen? But it did help because he was, he knew business so well and financing and the law, but it was really unbelievable how neat Craig and Moffat County has been um, for us that if it wasn't for Craig and Moffat County, we wouldn't be able to do what we're you know doing now. Well, one of the neat things too, and again, Rod was such a great help, and sadly he passed away back in 2001. But he had been such a great help. And the other thing we did at the time, the college was offering a small business program, an SBA program, and the guy at the time was Ken Farmer, and he was running the small business administration program through the community college here. And so we took some classes from Ken, and that helped a lot. You know, of how to set up an LLC, you know, the whole bit. And basically, with Rod's help and Ken's help and us wanting to stay here because we really wanted to stay here and even though we had the little property and we were doing pretty well <laughs> a 20 room property is I mean it was fun we enjoyed it but it had its limitations and we really wanted to be able to do more than mm -hmm. what we could with that little property and uh, I guess having the desire to stay here and be here long term and taking the risk because it certainly was a risk with the investments that we made, um, but we felt it was worth it. it. This was just an area that we fell in love with, and it wouldn't have been necessarily one we would have picked off the map, say, okay, let's go move here. But after we got here and made the kind of friends that we did and fell in love with the community, because there is such a sense of community, I don't know if I've ever lived in any place like this where everyone just kind of looks out for each other and mm -hmm. you know, helps each other. and you know everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose in a way that can be bad, but for us it's been very positive. Mm -hmm. and, and so we utilized the resources that we had available here and then it, it all fell into place and it all worked. Right. Uh, all right. Here we are. <laughs> um, well, go ahead. How have you seen the hotel business change in your experiences, you know, owning first the mom pod and then? Uh -huh. yeah. it, it, just because of our energy-based um, economy, which They've been talking about this probably for 100 years. It's kind of a boom and bust um, cycle. We happened to come in at the tail end after the power plant had been done. People had moved out, and we've experienced you know the growth of the um, economies done well, done well, done well. And I'd say that it's kind of been a straight up slope. But in 2000 and um, 10, Colorado started doing more um, vigorous overregulation, especially of the gas industry, but of all energy industry. And in 2010, it was almost overnight. You could look at our books and see it just all of a sudden we lost a third of our business overnight. And then at the same time, the new Candlewood Hotel opened up and the new Hampton Inn Hotel had opened up and they were both built for the energy industry but they hit the cycle wrong so everybody has really struggled for 2010 2011 2012 it started getting a little better 
2013, the first six months have been um, good, but I'm sure everybody, not to talk politics, but everybody has noticed that they're really from Washington, D.C., and even from some of the people in our state, there is a war on coal, and there's a war on um, energy, and even though we're all environmentalists, you have to balance people and their incomes and their livelihood and their lifestyle with the um, environment, with the animals and all that, but just from a business thing, that's kind of the cycle. When we moved here, everything's improved. 2010, I went, shoo, lost a third of our business, then it's starting to come up, but I'd say the future is, even though we're positive on it, it's uncertain because we're at the, um, we're, what, what, what wording would you we're kind use? We're at the mercy of, we're at the, mercy of, of the possible over over regulation of um, energy. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. certainly I've seen a lot of changes with that, and right now we're fortunate because we do have the energy, and what energy business we have that's going on right now, fortunately there's a lot of private land around here that's where the development's happening because the federal lands are getting more and more restricted. And so we've lost that avenue, but because we have enough private landowners around here where they're allowing exploration to happen, that's really been a boost to the area because if you took energy out of the equation for business for all of us, tourism is down, hunting is way down, really across the board most of the businesses are down, but energy is filling in, so we're showing somewhat of an increase but it's not because of the regulations, the over-regulations that are happening on the East Coast. It's in spite of what they're doing, we're seeing progress because it's progress on private land. And that's truly been a blessing because everything else is down. Hunting has been down every year for the last 10 years. We're not seeing the generational hunters that we used to. We used to see, you know, like a grandfather, father, and a grandson come in. We used to see husband and wife teams come in. We used to see younger adults come in. Now I think the average age that we probably see that stay in the hotels is probably in the mid to upper 50s. We're not seeing hardly anybody under the age of 40 anymore that comes in for hunting. And, you know, I don't understand why those demographics are changing. I don't know what's happening. I don't, a lot of it we've heard from our guests that used to stay, you know, every single year. The, most of it is because of the economy. Um, we also have had some guests um, make note of the fact that, of, you know, some of the gun regulations that have been instituted in the last few months, how unfriendly they've been, that a lot of hunters, even though they could still come up here hunting, they're not happy with the uh, position the state has taken with those um, new laws. And so some of them have expressed a desire to go other places to hunt as opposed to Colorado. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how that's going to play out. It may take a year or two to really see what the ramifications are because of those kinds of things that have happened. Okay. But um, it hasn't you know, been the most positive thing to happen with our state, uh, economically anyway. Well, okay. A couple of things off that then. The exploration for energy, is that just for coal or is that also for oil? Um, this last year and a half, it's been um, oil. The big players are um, Shell, Axia, and um, Quicksilver. Okay, and those are all looking for oil. Yes. And in 2010, a lot of it was natural gas, mm -hmm. and that's left. The reason we're doing well is mostly right now is the um, oil industry. All right, and because most of this is taking place on private land, is this federal land becoming protected, or it's just... Uh, it's regulations against the energy. It's becoming more and more um, protected. What's the area out here? The Vermilion Basin. Vermilion Basin. It, I'm not an expert on this, but there's a land use board locally that's made up of ranchers, farmers, environmentalists, local BLM, uh, Moffat County government officials that in that area they had agreements where most of it was going to be preserved, but a small percentage would be able to be used for future development. Two percent. Yeah, it was it was approximately um, two percent. Well, everybody here locally in this area, including the local uh, BLM and that, said they were fine with it, 
but it goes back to um, Washington and they say no the entire thing is cut off and it was just that's where I was saying that our area is at the mercy of Washington um, keep going <laughs> you know um, DC we think that there should be a balance between excuse me you didn't get shut it off oh sorry there needs to be a balance between industry people, environment, animals, you know, landscape, you know, and everything, but they just said no, nothing there. And 2% after, if they would have done the 2% after they had pulled out of that 2% area, put it back the way that it naturally was, then they could have gone to another, um, you know, 2%. And the mm -hmm. most frustrating thing is, like, our trapper mine here, as won national in awards on their environmental um, programs that they, you know, surface mine the coal and they put it back in the same place that it was and a lot of times better that the coal industry is not what people have in their minds in the 1800s of dirty, you know, miners. It's, it has cleaned up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we, we we have heard in a couple interviews about um, a little bit of the technology has been explained uh -huh. in turn of uh, the scrubbers that have been installed, the, the, the new scrubbers that have put uh -huh. in place. And we have heard a lot about that new regulation, that push for the clean uh -huh. energy. Um, all this, I feel, lends in... Yeah, no problem. No, that's right. All of this feels like a pretty decent lead-in um, uh -huh. to Romney, if you don't that's mind. That's really what change. happened. <laughs> yeah, so um, if we can just start, I just have a few questions uh -huh. jotted down on this. Uh, how, did you, how did you first get into contact with Mitt Romney? My wife and I were actually just sitting at home going, what can we do to help our area? We're at the mercy of Washington, D.C. We're at the mercy of even our state um, capital, and what can we do to help? And approximately, was it six or nine months prior to us contacting um, Mitt Romney's campaign, a group called Energy for America had done a tour. They had a big giant bus that came through, and they were pro um, energy. And of course, everybody's an environmentalist, but the overregulation is what's killing us. So Tri-State, um, they went to the Tri-State plant, did a video, and then they contacted us and said, as business people, would you be willing to be um, in the video? And Carrie and I said, yes, anything that will help our area. So the video was called um, The Perfect Storm Over Craig, Colorado. So Carrie and I were in the video, and we described what happened in 2010, that basically overnight we lost a third of our business, we okay. had to lay off people that had worked for how many years for us? One of them was a 17, the other one about 12. 12 years that we had to immediately cut our expenses that it was so bad um, overnight. In fact, it was so upsetting because the one lady who was our assistant, just a few years later, she lost her um, house. <laughs> and it was very upsetting. So Carrie and I were in the video and the video um, came out. It does a complete explanation, again, from their view of how energy dependent we are, especially in the coal. And the whole you know, crux of it is Moffat County is being overregulated by the federal government and the um, state government. So that came out. The I don't know what level of viral is, but the video went viral. Carrie and I, besides other people, we sent it to every senator, representative, any federal, state, government official we could think of, and the thing went viral. Um, within Colorado? Within the country. Yeah, we even <laughs> sent it to all the media outlets in Colorado, and it was funny because after Romney after Mitt Romney came here, one of the TV stations asked, well, why didn't you contact us? I said, well, if you look through your emails, we did. Mm -hmm. We sent you a copy of this video. We sent a letter to you explaining the dire situation our county is in and what we're facing because everyone was trying to take away our way of life. 
um, you know, our, our hunting is down, we're over-regulating uh, even the hunting and limiting the draws, and we have animals dying all over the place, but you can talk to an outfitter about that. They can give you more specifics right. than I can. I can only tell you what our customers are telling us, because we don't <laughs> personally hunt. But we were just being attacked on every level that makes this area thrive. We were being attacked, and like Frank said, you know, we we were desperate enough. It's like, okay. Yeah. So after the video came out and the national election came up, Karen and I went, what can we do to help our area? And we went, we'll invite Mitt Romney <laughs> to come to Craig, Colorado. So Carrie and I sat in her office, Carrie's at the computer, and wrote what we thought was a very compelling letter of, if you would like to win the election, we feel that Colorado is going to be a swing state and energy is going to be one of the main subjects in the national um, you know, purview that we knew that if energy is done properly, we aren't over-regulated, that it's good regulations but not over-regulated, that it would create jobs and it would create wealth here as opposed to sending it to foreign countries. So we were really just as soon as we sent the email, we thought he would come. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, about a month or I don't know how. Well, what was we it? We sent the email in February, and then he contacted well, us. Okay, just a, okay. So <laughs> three months had gone by, and we really hadn't thought about it. Right. And it was really um, coincidental. We were going to. We flew to Indianapolis, Indiana, for Carrie's niece's high school graduation. So we're just pulling into the um, parking lot of the hotel in Indianapolis, and our assistant here called and goes, you're not going to believe this, Mitt Romney's advanced people are in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and they want to come to Craig, Colorado, and we're going, you're kidding me. Mm -hmm. So I, Carrie, I said, Carrie, go check in. Let me take care of this. So they gave me the name of, and I can't remember his name, of the Mitt Romney person to call. So I called him up and they said, yes, we're here, we're on the ground, we're looking at it, where's a good place to have it? So I suggested um, the park downtown, you know, plus a couple of other things, and they said, okay, who can we talk to that can coordinate all of the, um, the police chief, the mayor, all the different, you know, entities who do you know that can help us do that? And I said, oh, my friend Tony St. John, I, he's really well known in the area. I said, he, could, he knows the mayor, the police chief, you name it, he knows them. And he goes, okay, we'll call him. So I called up our friend Tony St. John and I said, Mitt Romney's campaign is going to be calling you in the next five minutes. Start looking up and get them the contact of the mayor, the police chief, and all of this, and he's going, sure, friend, sure. <laughs> and he goes, how's your vacation? <laughs> and I'm going, Tony, I'm not kidding you. And he goes, yeah, right. you're <laughs> right. So that, so I hang up. About 15 minutes later, he goes, Mitt Romney's campaign really, <laughs> um, really um, called. And he goes, I got him in contact with the mayor, the police chief, and all this. He goes, I cannot, you know, believe it. Here's a national presidential campaign, which we found out later. No one of that stature has come to Craig, Colorado for a political you know, campaign before. So it was big news whether somebody was a Republican, Independent, or Democrat. We hit the map, and just what we wanted to happen was going to happen. He's going to come here and talk um, energy. So it ended up that... Um, the next morning they said, now it's going to take us overnight to confirm everything, so don't get too excited, but we're pretty sure, but it's not a done deal. So the next um, morning, Carrie and I were on the golf course in um, Indianapolis, and we played a hole, played another hole, and we're golfing with two people they had put us in, in with there, and the phone rings, and they go, we're pretty sure we're coming, but we'll let you know in just a little bit. So we're telling the guys that we're with that we might have to stop our golf game because <laughs> we might have to go back to um, Craig. So we played a couple more holes, and they go, yes, it's a done deal. We're coming. 
So it was really um, neat. We just hopped in the cart, went to the desk, and talked to the golf pro and said, we own a hotel in Craig, Colorado. Mitt Romney's coming with his national campaign. You know, this is really exciting. The golf pro didn't even count. He just grabbed two hundred dollars, <laughs> put it on the counter, and said, "You know, um, here's your refund for your golf. Get out of here. Have a good time. We, we support Mitt and Romney, we'll watch the news. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll watch the news because we can say, you know, we." These people golfed on our golf course, <laughs> so it was pretty cool. So Carrie and I, have, Carrie, has, well, you tell this. You have to tell your niece that you can't. You have to come back, or do you want me to tell us? <laughs> okay. So Carrie, we go to her niece's um, house, talk to her, and say, "This is very, very important." But Mitt Romney, presidential campaign, wants to come to our hotel um, the next day, would you mind if we leave? And she goes, no, that's who I'd vote for, and not to be disrespectful, but she goes, if it was the other guy, I wouldn't let you go. <laughs> so um, we made arrangements, hopped on um, the plane, came back to um, Craig, Colorado to meet their front people. Mm -hmm. so we actually thought, um, we we have a good crew, and our assistant, Lori, and, and Amanda, our front desk, uh, supervisor were really trying to handle everything, but it was getting more and more complicated because the Secret Service needed part of the hotel, and the press corps needed another part of the hotel, and right. the campaign people needed another part of the hotel. We had quite a few people in house that we weren't going to move because they were long term uh, energy <laughs> people. And so we had, to, because they wanted to book the entire hotel, and we had some outstanding reservations that we called the other hotels and asked that they would take them, and they said, of course they would. And so it started to get more complex on um, the, the things that they do behind the scenes, I guess, and even with Secret Service, because we right. had to go through our fire system with them, our security system, and, and so it just, even though our staff said they could handle it, we asked them, do you want us to come back? They said, yes, mm -hmm. said, okay, we'll come right back. And, and so we flew back, and, uh, uh, and again, it, it still took a couple of days to put it together, because that was Saturday, and he got here, what, was it Tuesday night? Or no, no he, he got here Monday night. Yeah. And then we got to meet with him a little bit Monday night and visit with him. And but we came back Saturday. Yeah, yeah so we came back Saturday and worked with Secret Service and, and worked with his campaign people that are his front people that come out first. Mm -hmm. Well, it was really interesting to me. I don't know if it would be interesting to other people when we met the head of security for the contingency. It was To me, it was humorous. He goes, now, how do you know Mitt Romney, and what are we doing in Craig, Colorado? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, just the way he said it, and I went, well, my wife and I sent him a letter, and he came um, here. And w w to me, one of the most exciting things for our area was, it's not like he was from going from point A to point B, and we happened to be in the middle. He was in San Diego. They intentionally came all the way to Craig, Colorado for a special trip. And then after he was gone, they went to Las Vegas. So okay. this was not just a trip that they happened that we were in the middle. They planned to come to, yeah, you know, it wasn't to Craig, like Colorado. A Denver to Salt Lake trip, and they just stopped here in the middle. They flew all the way from Southern California up right. here, stayed the night, and then flew back to Las Vegas, and then went back to Southern California. So they purposely came up here. Yeah, that the Moffat weekend. County. And you know, we talked to them about energy and said. You know, we strongly feel that American energy is really what can get the economy going again, and it can create jobs. And we are living proof that clean coal technology works. And we look at our area; it's it's mostly energy, and what isn't energy is tourism. And the tourism is mostly based on our wildlife, and we have wildlife everywhere. And if our energy was so bad and so corrupt the way some people try and make it out to be, then you'd probably see oh mutated deer and elk and antelope and, and, and everything else around here. And you don't. You do see the clean energy working here. Our skies are cleaner than just about anywhere else you can go. But it's not enough to tell people that or even to show people that. The only time we have hazy skies out here is when we're, we have wildfires in Arizona or Southern California or mm -hmm. Southern Colorado. Or, yeah. You know, that's the haze that you're seeing right now. That's not from anything around here. And it was really interesting during the Olympics that were in China and Beijing. You know, Beijing wanted to clean up their skies for the Olympics there on the national stage. So they shut down all their power plants, their coal-fired power plants, that they don't have the same kind of... Um, Controls, Controls that we do, we do. 
And that was when Mount Zirkel, who had been complaining all this time, Sierra Club had been complaining all this time, saying our coal was bad, well, immediately cleaned up when China shut down. Their readings went... We don't again, know. We're not yeah, scientists. We're not scientists. So, again, research that and see what you can find out. But that's where they saw the significant change. And they, from what we were hearing, and again, you know, small towns, you hear things, whatever, but a lot of things cleaned up around here when China shut down their pollution. And uh, it was nice to see that because I think some of the blame had been coming this way when it was, you know, again, it was a fallacy. It was falsely placed. Um, well, again, a lot of it is, I think, uh, there's not enough understanding of really how our energy works, especially in this country. Well, I was wondering, before, I, I want to get more into yeah. this for sure, but before we do, um, we hear from other people when we interview, and even just now, we, we keep hearing this, the term overregulation. So I was wondering if you don't mind talking about what those overregulations are, what they look like, because um, I personally really don't know. So I didn't know if you could speak about that a little bit. Okay. I'm not a, um, a scientist. I, if I was trying to totally speak on facts, the reason we use my wife and I use the term overregulation. Mm. If there's no way that anybody should not want any regulation, right? Yeah. As far as to, well, I'll talk about just a few things. I'm not sure if any House Bill 101365 um, came up a little bit prior to this, and what it was, Denver wanted to clean up the haze in Denver. So they, um, don't quote me on the exact numbers, they had four or five power plants there that they wanted to switch from coal to natural um, gas. Okay. Which sounds good on the surface, but the problem was a lot, most of that coal that they were burning in the Denver area comes from 20-mile coal, which keeps our um, coal miners employed. So this law passed, and it was done behind the scene. It was like um, Benz, who was the chairman of the PUC, actually ended up going to work for um, XL Energy. It was not done in a fair and open manner. It was one of the quickest bills ever passed. It affected our area, but we didn't have a say in it. That, well, that... I was going to say, one of the challenges, too, with that is that the coal that was coming from our area, our coal is the highest BTU, lowest sulfur coal in the United States. It's basically the cleanest burning coal in the country. The challenges that Denver were having weren't from coal, but they were using coal as a way to say. I mean, that, that was their cure-all for everything. That it was, it's all coal's fault that Denver has haze. But when you get right down to it, it's not the coal. Hmm. It's not coal that's causing all the haze in Denver. There's a lot of other factors. Well, the biggest factor in Denver, this was a form of overregulation. They're trying to clean up the air in Denver. They're getting rid of coal. They're switching to natural gas. It all sounds good. But like Carrie was saying, their biggest problem is the automobiles in Denver. If somebody really wanted to do something, and again, I'm not a scientist, but if the whole objective was to clean the air in Denver, they should have made it mandatory that all of the automobiles in Denver switch from gasoline to natural gas. That would have made a giant, major impact on their air quality as opposed to just doing the easy fix that they said was an easy fix in the um, coal. So they want to clean the air in Denver, but they really don't want to do anything that's going to affect their lifestyle, affect their income or whatever, because I'm sure it would cost a fortune to switch every car in Denver over to natural gas, but that would have been a better solution that would have fixed something than doing a quick, easy solution that in the newspaper sounds good and makes everybody feel happy. The thing is, they didn't mention how much the costs are going up and even on our bills now we're paying for Excel to be retooling these plants to natural gas. That cost is being passed on to us and they kept saying, well, it really wasn't going to raise rates. Well, when you go back and you start looking at the rates, it did. You know, it's just all these promises, of, well, we're, we're going to do this and it's not going to cost you anything. 
that's not how it works out. And you know, our bills are going up. And this is an example. I've got family. Well, you guys probably understand this too from being Southern California. When Dewey was living in Morco, um, I'm not exactly sure where in Southern California that is. It's, uh, I can point it out on a map, but I don't know what, what the big areas are around it. His cooling bills were almost $1,500 a month for air conditioning. And I've my mother's husband in Mesa, Arizona, I think his bills are around $800 a month for air conditioning. And he keeps the house about 80 82 I mean, we can't stand it. It's so hot. We have inexpensive energy in this area. But when they keep putting in these over-regulations and trying to switch to things that make people feel good but they don't un necessarily understand the costs associated, those prices keep going up and up and up. And it and hurts the poor and it hurts everybody because it's a high part of their um, their um, income. The latest thing of over-regulation, Senate Bill 10, was it 252? Yes, 252. 252 the people in Denver were trying were, were trying they did force on the rural community and this was totally targeted towards tri-state which this plant here is one of the largest power plants in the country but they targeted tri-state and said originally that we want you to go from 10 percent which everybody had agreed on um, prior 10 percent renewable energy to 30 percent um, renewable um, energy, but the the bill was only directed at rural electric associations, and that was something. One, it was it was the um, Denver has a larger population trying to force everybody with no input of here you're going to go from 10 to 30 percent. So Carrie and I and other um, people, the county commissioners, have gone down and testified before the um, House and Senate people concerning 252, how it was going to affect um, our area. So Carrie and I also went down and testified at a you know different hearing of how this is going to affect the price of energy in rural electric, how it's going to affect um, our business and one of the saddest things that happened there's a town called Nucla in Colorado that has a tri-state um, power plant and the Democratic and Republican senators asked Ken Anderson who's the um, manager of tri-state what is going to happen if you are forced to do this much more renewable energy and without putting words in his mouth from my recollection of what he said was it's going to put us in a situation that we're going to have over capacity because the coal that we're burning you know, now and you add the energy that, that we're going to have to do with the renewables, that means we're going to be producing extra energy which we don't need. And they said, what's going to happen? And he said, we're going to have to close down Nucla's coal, I mean, you know, the, their um, coal generated plant. And to me, the saddest thing that happened is the Republicans and Democrats sitting there, the um, lady who was the um, president of the Nucla, Nucla Chamber of Commerce got up there, testified, and said words to the effect of, this is our biggest employer, it's our biggest person who pays the property taxes, our education, and everything, and they said, our town there won't be a town. We won't even be able to afford um, anything because this power plant, the people that work there, if it's shut down, they're trying to, to do it almost immediately, we're wiped out. And the Democrats, and you can tell what political affiliation I am, so I apologize if I offend anybody, that lady poured her guts out. No one asked her a question. She sat there waiting for interaction, nothing, nowhere, no compensation for them, no money for job training, you know, it's just you are going to have to be devastated because we're trying to do something for the entire state and all of the people and it's your tough luck. They didn't use those words, but they basically, so that lady got up, went back and sat in the audience and my wife and I testified after her and we were just unbelievable 
how can you overregulate oh an industry God. and force renewables that are going to have to be subsidized that aren't as effective as this power plant and it's just going to be shut down and that's where I'm saying overregulation again there needs to be a balance of people economies families clean environment wildlife and everything but once the thing is tilted and it's all the environment and you forget about the people that's not a society that I think is good and when that bill was passed it showed me that they don't care anything about the all they care is about the environment well guess what I care about the environment I care about people I care about jobs I care about people it, it, again this is not about me but that's what was missing was what you're doing, you aren't even considering what the, the effects are going to be. Well, the other thing, too, that was upsetting, especially with this House or the Senate Bill 252, that expense that is passed on to the rural parts of Colorado, it doesn't affect anybody in Denver. It doesn't affect anyone in Colorado Springs. It doesn't affect anyone in the larger cities that aren't getting their power from a rural co op. It only affects people that live out in areas like this. So we're all going to pay for it. They can pass all these still good legislations that they want. They're not going to pay for it. We are. And when you have a business like ours, that sometimes in the summer months our bills can reach close to anywhere from three to five thousand dollars for our electric bill. And if those costs end up doubling, that 10, is 20, money. 30, 40, yeah. Fifty percent. Yeah. yeah. Where where are we supposed to? How are we supposed to handle that when we have a business? We've already lost roughly 30-35% of energy that left the state. It isn't energy that stopped working. It's energy that actually left Colorado and went to North Dakota, went to western Pennsylvania, went up to Wyoming. They're still working. They're just not working here. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we lose that much of our income. And for all of 2010, Frank and I carried all of our employees with our savings. We weren't making enough in our business, but we kept thinking things will get better. <laughs> things will get better. It's going to oh. get It was just, it's very upsetting mm -hmm. and the the overregulation the people who are coming up with these rules and regulations don't look at the human side and if if humanity is not more important or at least as important that's when you, it's upsetting. It is upsetting. When you look at some of the things that the government has put money into with these renewables, they did a lot of uh, solar stuff on the front range. Mm -hmm. Th these were companies that came out of Sweden and other foreign countries. They went bankrupt. All that money went to their country. It didn't come back to the community. You know, they're subsidizing this and it's not working and they're going bankrupt and they're still walking away with U.S. tax dollars somewhere else. Why are they doing that? We have the technology here. They need to utilize it and run with it. You look at the wind farms. The untold amount of deaths caused to birds from wind farms is astronomical. But if you kill an eagle uh, in any other way, you know, you'll get fined, you'll go to jail. But if a wind turbine kills an eagle, it's no big deal. They're killing thousands of them. Again, do your research. I can only tell you what we're reading in the paper, whatever, so I don't know it firsthand, but just from stuff yeah. that we've been reading. So do the re I mean, they're even killing condors, I think, in California. So check yeah. those things out. If you want to keep going, another over-regulation is, and again, don't quote me on the exact dollar amount, but Carrie and I um, also <coughs> have gone to Denver and testified, and this is totally on the visibility of our area. So you two have been here, you go out and look at our area, and remember we've got even there's wildfire that is in Moffat County and Route County, that's where the um, haze is coming from. Come here when we don't have wildfires in Arizona and that, we've got beautiful, perfect, pristine um, skies but uh, two years ago at the same time, and this really was not a um, bill like 252 or 101365, the Air Quality Commission said, Tri-State Plant in Craig, Colorado, we want you to improve the deciview um, in your area. And it's a new word I learned was deciview, 
and I'd have to look it up to get the, th the exact yeah, description of it, but deciviews have to do with the discernible difference in eyes. So if you went out and looked at this, quality. well, air quality, but it's the visi this yeah. is all visual. So when Carrie and I testified for that one, it was the Uber environmentalists were trying to get them to spend six hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars to clean up eight hundred million. Yeah, eight yeah, yeah. six hundred to eight hundred million dollars to change the visibility that the naked eye could not discern. So if you just went out and looked at here, everything looks, you know, fine. Six or eight hundred million dollars, they put all this equipment on that the naked eye could not discern a difference. Everybody agreed the naked eye could not discern a difference, but they wanted them to spend the money. So when we testified, I basically said, your intent and purpose is you actually want them to spend so much money that they're going to think economically, do we want to keep this power plant open, and you're trying to force them to close it. That is what your objection objective is. And I brought up the same thing is, where are you taking care of the people that might lose their jobs in this? So if you're going to do this stuff, where is the training, where is the money for um, yeah, yeah. diversification of the economy and everything? I said it has to be win, win, win. You can't have your way in everything. Well, it ended up Tri-State agreed with the um, Air Quality Commission. They would spend, and I'm, I'm not talking for Tri-State, but I think it ended up they're spending approximately three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars in the next year, year and a half, where they are going to put on some super controls on it, and the de they're going to spend that much money, and the naked eye can still not discern the um, visibility. Well, the thing That's about overreaction, over regulation. This panel, this air quality control panel, was going against what the state of Colorado had already agreed to with Tri-State. They had a previous uh, agreement with them. The state had already set up uh, parameters that they're happy with. Tri-State said they would do those parameters. Is this air quality, is this a federal? Uh, it was, everybody's trying to get ahead of the um, EPA, so it was state people saying, if we do this, we can get Denver and the state ahead of the um, EPA. So the EPA didn't come in and say do this. The state um, was saying it. Yeah, and the other interesting thing, too, that they did on this hearing, they didn't send out any kind of press release for anyone to know. They they said they sent yeah, an email to um, the clerk and recorder's office, but they didn't publish it because they said it was too expensive to publish. In fact, one of the people on the panel pretty much accosted me in the ladies' room <laughs> at this uh, where the hearing was being held, and I asked her, I said, well, why weren't we notified? And she goes, well, uh, it's just too expensive. And then somebody else on the panel said, well, you know, you can email, and it is free to email. I said, look, we all check emails. Why didn't you send something for our community? Because they, know, they the did the, the week every before Christmas to make sure nobody could come. That's our opinion. And, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's our opinion. Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult for people to come. In fact, um, there was a presentation made to the local government agencies here, or at least the city council, asking if someone from the city council could come to this hearing. And they all said no. They already had prior uh, commitments. They couldn't get away. And we were asked. And we said absolutely. We dropped everything and went. We were available. We are very fortunate. Again, we own our own business. We set our own hours. And we've got a good crew. And we just asked, look, can you guys watch the hotel? Can you call one of our friends to be their pets? we need to leave, and they said sure, and so they, they covered us for, we were only gone for one night and came back the next day, but it just, you know, not everyone can do that, and it, it is hard. We're fortunate that we do have probably a little more flexibility than a lot of people do to be able to drop everything and go, but, you know, our livelihood is on the line, and it's we our have... family, friends, and neighbors yeah, in our have, community. You know, we have a house across the street from us that's in foreclosure. There are several houses in our neighborhood that are up for sale. We've had friends that have, uh, one of them lost their homestead. Um, we have friends that own businesses that are in trouble. They've had to lay people off to people that they've had. I mean, we have a couple of friends that have had long-term employees that they've had 
for at least 15 plus years, if not more, they've had to lay off as well. And, you know, when it's your friends and your neighbors and your family that are getting hurt, you're going to do everything you can to fight. So, you know, this is home. I'd rather see <laughs> a drag line on the hillside than all these empty houses on our street or, you know, other streets around town. We've been through enough streets in this town where there's so many empty buildings, there's so many empty houses, and a lot of this has been self-inflicted because of state over-regulations and federal over-regulations that are pushing people out and losing jobs. But there's no mitigating factors to help these people retool and get into something else. Some of our friends right now are even working up in North Dakota because mm -hmm. that's where the jobs are. And, you know, the jobs can be here too if you take some of the uh, extremist port part out of the equation and let our energy work for this country. Okay. So, does everybody else keep talking this much? No, this is <laughs> excellent. No, 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 this is fine. We should hear long enough. As long as, as long as we're not taking too much of No, time. we're fine. Um, with Mitt Romney coming, uh -huh. I, I mean, I'm sure that was the main yes. goal, and I, sure. I, I don't mean uh -huh. anything by this, but I'm, yes. I know that, you know, Romney would have brought instant visibility then to a lot of these issues. Uh -huh. So, what did it mean for the community, especially from your point of view, being small business owners, for him to come? I think at the time, for no other um, terms, and yes, we know there's the Republican um, perspective, there's the independent perspective, and there's the Democrat perspective, but our perspective of our area is we're all in an energy environment no right. matter what your political belief. Right. But he actually, when he came, he brought hope of we, and I can't even, you know, of course speak for him, but he brought hope. He, um, When he came, we got to visit with him just for a few minutes. The night he came, and the next morning he had a round um, table of someone with, from education, different... Um, we had um, mine president, um, banker, real estate, banker, real estate us, and he just visited with us, discussed right. energy, and his basic thing was, we need all forms of energy. He was um, um, for renewables, you know, wind and solar. He was for gas, <laughs> coal, um, oil. you know, oil and all of the above, but do it in a common sense manner and have an actual plan where over X amount of years we are cleaning the environment up at the same time. He was totally, in my opinion, opposed to overnight saying no oil, no gas, <laughs> yeah, no um, coal, let's all do solar. He had a realistic view of it. At the same time, you can put people to work and let's look at the long range because we all want a clean um, environment. He was willing to do the work of planning, implementing, and doing, improving our economy, having jobs, but still knowing that we want to have a clean planet. He combined the humanistic side with the scientific side, with the environmental side, and, and the, um, the business side. So he was not, don't do renewables, he was balancing it, and I think that gave everybody um, hope, and it was super exciting. The mine, 20 Mile, said anybody that would like to come and see Mitt Romney, they would bus him here. I, there was, don't quote me, but the newspaper article, I think there was 300 miners that came here, the community, and... I mean, everybody I mean, came I, out. It wasn't just Republicans that came out. Everybody, everybody came everybody. to see him because Absolutely it was such everybody. an exciting thing and for our area. And it did people. People were excited. Right. And that, that's what I'm saying yes. is that at this point, from what I've seen, if I'm allowed to make this type sure. of assumption, oh, yes. it's um, <laughs> based on talking to people, this isn't an issue of political parties. It's not a bipartisan okay. issue. It's yes. an issue of political platforms. Yes. And uh -huh. I think that that really was a lot different than a lot of the rhetoric that you saw right. in the last presidential election uh -huh. and even what you see now in the current you know, politics uh -huh. of things. It's a lot about political affiliation, right. but this wasn't. This was about right. the platform of right. energy. Right. Yes. So the community seemed wholeheartedly yeah. behind it. And it was a platform of him actually caring what happened to all of Okay. Them. It was national right. attention to right. a, a national um, problem with a national um, 
solution. Yeah, because right. it, it really was something that could get the entire economy going again that would benefit all Americans, not just some Americans, right. not just some class of Americans or some affiliation of Americans. Mm -hmm. It would affect all Americans. And, you know, simplistically, <laughs> you get right down to it, if this country became energy independent, which it certainly can with our own resources, we certainly wouldn't need to be in all the foreign theaters that we're in where we are putting our own Americans in harm's way. And, you know, that's a very simplistic view of it, but using our energy independence to become strong again is a very, very real uh, concept that I think he was willing to look at and unify everybody together, and that's why I think so many people were so excited. It wasn't just a political candidate that came here. It was someone that was actually listening to the heartbeat of the area, because he did meet, like Frank said, with a lot of us. I think there was like eight or ten of us for about an hour, hour and a half before the rally was held. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, we had a cross-section of people from the real estate industry, from the car industry, from the teaching field, from the mining industry, banking industry, you know, us, and then I think uh, another small business owner that has a, or one was a rancher and then one was, uh, owns an excavation company here. Oh. And so we got a pretty good cross-section of how the over-regulations have actually affected all of us as far as small businesses, where the challenges have come. And even uh, the car dealer spoke of the difficulty in even selling their products because of how the loan structure has changed. The, the real estate lady talked about the challenges of people even qualifying for um, loans for a house because too many people were qualifying that never should have qualified and now it's kind of gone in reverse. People that actually have enough money that would have qualified before, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've heard all that too. So he was listening to every single one of us, which was just wonderful. And it, it, it really did give everybody in the area hope. hope that someone's listing to people outside of Washington, D.C. And it brought a lot of people even over from Steamboat and from other smaller communities. And Bertle. Well, that was my next and question. And oh, yeah. What was the public reception um, like? But well, we think it was very positive. Yeah. And, of course, in anything, there was people that have different views. But I would say a vast majority of the people, even ones with different views, were excited a presidential yeah. candidate was here and was bringing attention to rural um, America and its challenges, and instead of trying to solve problems for Washington, D.C., it was like here was someone that came to an area and goes, you know, if I was president, what would you like, what would you like me to consider yeah. to help your circumstance here? So it was bipartisan of what can, you know. And one of the things, too, that I thought was actually kind of exciting after getting to visit with him and talk to him and hear him talk to some of the other business owners here too is that when he <laughs> was on the campaign trail many of the things he said he quoted from what he discussed here. Now chances are he probably had some of the same discussions in some other communities but there are a lot of his talking points that were that were words that either came out of my mouth, Frank's mouth, some of the other mouths of the people in the room. He quoted a lot of us. He wasn't using our names, but he was quoting, you know, the subject the and subject how business, small business people are saying this. So he listened to everybody. And when we uh, saw all the different uh, media outlets that did stories, because again, you know, we had a lot of the press corps staying with the hotel, and so we checked into their stories. I think we saw like 42 different stories of different internet news organizations, paper organizations, radio, you know, the whole bit, and TV as well. And all of them were quoting uh, people from this community. And that was a pretty neat thing to, to see, too, that those people that spoke here, that those words were being propagated further. Right. And uh, that was pretty neat. And again, it, we thought it was a unifying event for all of us, specifically, or especially because we do have friends here that um, they're affiliated with a different political party, but they were just as excited. Mm -hmm. as we were, and they were happy to have him here, and that somebody actually was listening to, you know, cries for help from him. Right. This is just a question of curiosity. Was there any discussion of other issues uh, that brought up, or was this really, um, you know, about the energy? Oh, no, we discussed everything. I mean, he discussed education. Again, he discussed uh, the banking industry. He discussed... Um, it was strange. He didn't discuss with everything with the different um, local businesses here that are all in different you know segments of business but it all actually did come back to our area we really have hope now because of the um, 
oil were the coal we're just not um, sure about, but our future were, even though if someone can listen to this, I think everybody is, or I shouldn't say, most people are optimistic in our community, but we know that there is hope, but if Washington, D.C. or our own government does continue over, over, over regulating, it's going to hurt us, but when, back to your question was, it was b mostly tied to energy because all of the industries that were at that meeting with him depend on the success of our economy, which is energy-based. Well, even if you look at the education system in the state of Colorado and even in the state of Moffat County, Moffat County doesn't rank very highly mm -hmm. in the entire state. And there are um, challenges, and a lot of it has had to do with funding and, funding mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the lack of funding. And if you look again, do your research, look statistical analysis of when you know, Colorado was actually cruising pretty well through the recession. We really didn't join the recession until after the, some of those over regulations kicked in. Mm -hmm. And Colorado had a lot of funding. It was doing well. We were in the black. Education was actually doing fairly well. We joined the recession. Colorado was one of the last, last states, states to, join. to join the recession, and that was with the attack on energy. The energy revenue went down and that was paying a good the portion energy, of the bills. Right. It was paying a lot of the bills. It was funding the state, the, the state coffers, it was funding education and you know it I can't understand why it has escaped so many people's attention that when you attack energy the way it was attacked in this state and that all that funding disappears, that they don't seem to understand how we went from being in the black and not in the recession, but all of a sudden we're in the recession and we're running a deficit. Like, who do you think was paying all the bills before? And he chased them away, and they ran up to North Dakota, they ran over to Western Pennsylvania, <laughs> they went up into Wyoming. They're still working, and they're even over in Utah. But because of, you know, the permitting process and how long it all of a sudden went from, I don't know if it was like 90 days to 214 days to pull a permit to do yeah, the drill. We don't know the exact yeah, figures. we don't know the figures. We just, again, just from some of the things our guests have told us, so you need to research that. I don't know that firsthand. Mm -hmm. But to hear it over and over again that all of a sudden it went from this to that and it wasn't feasible to work here anymore, so they're going to go work in states where it was uh, more economic More friendly. energy friendly. Right. But, uh, okay. know, it's and so, yeah. You're probably tired of it rambling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Yeah. Trickle down economic effect. Simple <laughs> economics. Okay. So you're seeing energy move out of the state, basically, is what you're saying. Not not even over the other states. Yeah, but over 2010 it did. It's starting to come back. You know, locally, coal is still under a lot of, of pressure. Oil is coming back, like Carrie had previously said, and the reason oil is coming back to the area is because most of the places that are exploring are on private land. But our challenge is with um, Vermilion Basin, that's BLM, federal land, and I can't remember the exact percent, a large portion of Moffat County is federal land. So we have the hope of the um, oil industry you know, um, doing well but it's mainly because it's private, you know, land, and it's not that everything's oil and coal and gas, but we like it. Our area is agriculture. We have tourism. We, but they all coexist and mingle with um, energy, and it's made a great foundation for our economy. But over regulation, it can bust, or if we have good, reasonable regulation, and it could succeed. The environment's going to be taken care of. We can, um, or people are going to have good-paying um, jobs, and tourists can come here because it's a clean environment. And we think everything can um, it can be win-win-win. Okay. Um, Kind of, you've kind of answered this, so if it seems redundant, we can skip to the next. Um, but how has the political atmosphere in Craig changed um, since you've been here? Have you seen it? And I don't just mean mm -hmm. issues that have been important, but public involvement um, or public awareness of issues that are coming up. How have you seen the political atmosphere changed? Because to me, it seems like both of you are very well informed and involved in this process. Well, I think that. I 
how have you, you seen it change? I can tell you how I wish it would change. <laughs> 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 no, people are more cognizant and, and aware of our... Oops, you need... Oh, oh. People are more cognizant and uh, um, aware, and people are becoming more um, active because when the economy isn't what it needs to be, especially locally, it is affecting everybody, and people are becoming more politically active. It just when mm -hmm. things come up like House Bill 252, 10, 13, 65, the Air Quality Commission, you know about the deaths of views and you know visibility rural communities that don't have the population base like Denver does, we have to be able to speak up and get more and more um, people involved. I would say, I can't put it a percentage, more and more people are becoming engaged, I think nationally, but especially locally, but we're still not at the point where Moffat County can stand up and talk and we have gotten people to listen, but we have to be able to change their minds. So I'm not. Did that answer your question? No. Yeah. 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 No, it does. It does. Um, how? <laughs> this seems yes. less important. All the uh -huh. time. How long was he here? Well, how long was Romney here? Well, he came in uh, Monday evening. Packed his plane. Ended up being a couple hours yeah. late, so he didn't get in until it was around nine nine thirty that night. And we had expected him around six thirty seven. Okay. And so we we stayed until he was there and visited with him for a little bit. All right. So he stayed the night. Uh, and then we met in the morning, and then we did the rally, and then I think the rally lasted maybe two hours, or no, it wasn't that long. Maybe it was an hour. An hour, yeah. then they bought lunches for all the press and everything, and, and that, then they headed so back to the airport. And I'd say nine o'clock that night, and they were probably gone three or four the that ne the next afternoon. Okay, okay. okay. The one thing I need to say that was really exciting for Moffat County, because Carrie and I got to ride on the campaign bus. From our hotel, we took the back route, came to downtown, and it was one of the most ex exciting things for Moffat County, at least in my opinion. <laughs> when we got close to downtown, one of his front people said, On the radio. Governor, yeah, on the, on the walkie talkie, goes, Governor Romney, you're not going to believe this. And he goes, What? She goes, for the size of this community, we have never seen so many people before. He, this is exciting. Uh -huh. And Carrie and I were so proud to be on the bus with, you know, a future could have been President of the United States when there was such a big turnout. I mean, right. his... Yeah, I think he even said there's, there's about 1,500 people here in the town of about 10,000. Wow. Uh, in fact, the guy... Uh, and they had just come from San Diego, which I'm sure they had a big crowd, but we had a bigger... Uh, percentage -wise. Bigger percentage. The one guy, one of the front people called us after, or I think it was the next day after everybody pretty much had left, and wanted to know, you know, if everything went okay, if we had any challenges or anything, or, you know, with how people stayed in the hotel and was everything fine. We said, you know, everyone was wonderful. It was a great group to work with. And then that's when he told you that that was probably, percentage-wise, the best turnout since he had even been on Romney's campaign, mm -hmm. and he had been on since January. And he said to get 15% basically from the community was just unheard of. Wow. So they were, they were thrilled. Okay. And again, 1,500 people isn't very many, but well, consider how big yeah. No, you put it, it in the percentage, though. 15%, yeah. percent, that's, a, that's a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, since he's come um, and gone with, you know, with the way the election went and everything that's happening, how do you feel about Craig currently? Um, the political atmosphere, aside of from what we've talked about, just community involvement, mm -hmm. again, community worth, how do you feel about Craig right now? Um, I say everybody just from our experience Craig and Moffat County people have experienced so many boom and busts. It's just a hearty group of people that help each other. Neighbor helps neighbor. Community helps um, community. Everybody knows we've got the um, challenges but I think everybody is willing to accept the political challenges of the, um, the um, future. Okay. Well, we've even told our staff that we need to prepare three different ways for the future of our area. First is basically prepare for everything to stay the same. Um, second is prepare for things to get worse than they are now if some of these things happen where they really do want to shut down. 
these coal plants uh, that's, that would be economically crippling to this area. It would totally change the makeup of this area. And then our other plan, business plan that we have, what if things get a whole lot better? How are we going to handle it? Uh, so we basically have had to look at ourselves and our business, how quick we are to respond to the needs of how things change. And if they get better, uh, which they potentially certainly can. I mean, the potential is all here. The, the resources are all here. It's just whether or not we can get a green light to mm -hmm. pursue them. Um, and if they do, then we certainly need to expand our business and make it bigger and add more people on and, and all those kinds of things. But we also need to prepare if things get worse. Right. So we basically, you know, even told our staff at the beginning of the year, we kind of have a three-fold business plan that we're going to have to, you know, keep tabs on because, I mean, I, you know, I don't know, I suppose in business sometimes you can kind of coast along and know that things are going to be a certain way for quite a while, but when the rug got pulled out from under us, when a lot of those urban regulations kicked in, in and you see 35% of your business walk out the door, and it wasn't because new competition came to town, it was because the business we had was basically told they were no longer welcome in this part of the country. That's a huge uh, factor to have to deal with, and the hardest thing for us as business owners is not being in competition with, say, other hotels in our area. I feel like we know enough about our industry, what we need to do with our product, how we need to market our product, take care of our product, and position it in the marketplace to do well, and we've actually done very well with our, with our property. Our competition that we have a hard time with is <laughs> when the government takes away the business that normally comes to this area and makes it unfriendly for them where they can no longer afford to come and do business in our area. Mm -hmm. How do we compete with that? Because they're not offering us any alternatives. They're not you know, mitigating the loss with something else. And not only are we being attacked on our energy front, which basically is this area, but we're having challenges with the agriculture or some of the regulations they're doing with agriculture, and we're having challenges with tourism simply because they're going after hunting with the gun regulations. And the gun regulations are making it difficult for hunters because it's becoming now illegal, and I don't understand all the, the new laws because they're confusing. But if one hunter takes another hunter out with him and he loans him his gun, he just committed a felony. And so, you know, I don't understand all of it, but it's making it very challenging even for hunters. So a lot of the hunters, again, are expressing perhaps a desire to go somewhere else. So if we're being attacked on our energy, on our agriculture, on our tourism, what do we have left? What's going to sustain us? Because if we lose our energy here, we're going to lose our town. There's nothing else to make the economy go in this area. Who's going to pay all the bills at the hospital? Who's going to pay their mortgage payment? Who's going to pay for the schools? The money's going to go away. Who's going to come buy all those houses if all these people have to leave because all of a sudden they're losing their sixty, eighty, hundred thousand dollar a year jobs with benefits? Who are they going to sell their house to? Who's going to come in? What's going to happen? And the people on the Front Range and in Washington D.C. they don't. None of that's part of their equation. In fact, when we sat for that Senate bill hearing and got to talk. Um, a lady sat next to me, and she was this close to me, and she was one of the ones proposing, you know, let's uh, make uh, all these rural co-ops have to go, was it 30% yeah, by 2020? Yeah, from 10% 20. to... So basically a 200% increase in less than uh, 10 years. They have until 2020. Most of them can't do it because the permitting process takes longer than what, you know, than the seven years that's left. And I asked her, I said, what are you going to do for us? You know, you have all these wonderful ideas that you think work on paper, but this is all theory, but when it comes to fact and working it out, it doesn't work out the same way. And if you put all these people out of work, how are you going to help them? She had no answer. She didn't even care. How are we going to take care of this area if everyone starts losing their jobs? So right? Back to this question. Yeah. Oh. But no, well, I, mean, I no, think that's why people really are starting to pay attention because it's affecting everyone's livelihood now. Right. Before, you almost could say politics was almost an abstract concept that, oh, it's just a bunch of guys in suits out in Washington, D.C. It's not really affecting me. Now it's affecting all of us. and uh, It's affecting our way of life. It's affecting the value of our homes. You know the education that the children get, mm -hmm. uh, the 
their chances for education elsewhere. It's affecting everybody at the most fundamental levels now, and mm-hmm. I think that's why more people are starting to pay attention. All right, and we're ac- we are actually optimistic uh, about our economy and the possibilities here. But the most frustrating thing is, just like Carrie was saying, our future is too much in the hands of Washington D.C. and Denver for our, our own um, comfort. So mm-hmm. we're positive, but we're hesitant because of you know, those entities. And the fun thing is most of those people that are making decisions for areas like here have never been out here. Never been out here. That's why a lot of um, businesses in the energy industry are trying to get more people to come to our area, do tours of the power plant to the coal mines, you know, see the um, oil drilling, see the fracking and that, so they can see that they are responsible, you know, that. And if they do do something that, that might harm the environment, that they're going to, you know, clean it. And we think that the technology now and that, that it, there is a future for clean um, energy. But a part of our challenge is people are making decisions. We need to get them to come and experience Moffat County so they can see for them, you know, for themselves. Cause when we had mentioned two on this 252, we got up early in the morning, drove to Denver, and one of the things we testified, I said, was we get up in the morning, clear, beautiful skies, we look out from our house, you can see Tri-State Power Plant, just gorgeous. You know, the energy is um, coexisting with the environment and the wildlife. And I said, as we got closer and closer to Denver, the air quality got worse, and worse and worse and we're getting here and you're trying to clean up your area by making it tough on us and you're not identifying the problem of you have too many people here there's too many cars that's where your pollution is if you want a quick answer you should be switching all of your vehicles to electric which the coal mine will produce the power for them or natural um, gas, but they're trying to fix everything overnight. They're trying to fix it easily, and it's a long-term solution, you know, of diversifying the energy. But yeah, and coal really—they haven't proven that coal is the problem in Denver at all. But it's just it, like it's a lot of things. Fix. There's yeah, there's well, it's not even an easy fix because it's not going to fix. The problem. Well, I know they think but it's an easy yeah, fix. Yeah, they, they think it's okay. This is the target. Let's nail this one, and then we'll go off to the next one. And you know, there, there's financial gain for some people with these studies and with these uh, proposals, and those need to be checked out too. Okay. Um, thanks for letting us talk your ear off. No, I, I feel no, better thank now. Thank you. <laughs> Do you, got, do you guys have any just closing remarks or anything else you want to share? Oh, no, we're just excited about the whole um, program because history is so important to the, fu- to the future, and, and I don't know enough about history, but I do believe in the concept of you need to go back to history to be able to have a great um, future, and a lot of us don't learn our lesson from history <laughs> So we do have a good future. So to me, I'm just excited of all the stuff that you're doing, the museums um, doing, because the past is just as important as the future, if not more. Well, even in its simplest terms, education is the key. And if people really understood the potential that American energy has for this country, and you know, not only for our city and our county in Northwest Colorado and our state, but what it can do for this entire country and how it can help everybody. Mm. I, I think it's just a, an unrealized uh, and that fact. And energy does involve yeah. renewable. I mean, it involves everything, and we believe mm. in everything. And the, the funny thing is, I think a lot of people just they forget the educational aspect of understanding energy and how it works and then the associated costs with energy. And I have family, I've got five older brothers, and they're all in different parts of the country. None of them are in small areas like this. They're all in big cities. And most of them had never thought about how energy works. And most of them had the, the I don't want to say prehistoric image of what coal mines were, say from back to the 1800s. That's kind of an image maybe from a movie or something that got ingrained in their head. 
that they thought was still prevalent today. And they have no idea of the advances in technology and how they work. And we had the um, pleasure of being able to take tours, not only of our above ground mines, um, but we got to take a tour of Trapper, or Toy Mine, rather, it's below ground mine. And the technology is absolutely fascinating. And slowly but surely, my family's been coming around and, uh, you know, understanding how energy works. Because it was just nothing they ever thought about before. You know, big city, you turn on the lights, electricity. Mm. The electricity comes from the, you know, or the heat comes from the furnace. Mm. <laughs> you know, I never really thought kind of beyond that. And one of my brothers was kind of one of these uber liberals. Uh, he was living in uh, just outside of San Francisco at the time. And he traded in his great big Mercedes uh, S-Class 500, whatever it was for a Prius, because he thought it would make him feel good, you know, being a little more energy conscious. And he said, finally it hit him one night when he was plugging in the car. Somebody had to make that electricity. And he said, you know what, I'm in Northern California, and I don't really like the idea of nuclear. And, you know, my electric bill is about $1,500 a month. Um, and he said how much he loved coming out here and how clean it was. He'd never seen anything like it. Either. Maybe I had this all wrong to begin with. And I never thought about it. Somebody has to make that electricity for me to plug my car in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> never thought about it. And that's the funny thing is, a lot of people just don't think. And even when you know Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast, a lot of people thought their heat came from the furnace. Well, it does, but somebody still has to make the heat to get to your furnace, or someone has to make the power. And it just kind of goes on and on and on. But a lot of people don't really think that far, I mean, we've heard people, even in the grocery stores here, they think all the meat comes from the grocery store. They didn't realize you had to go kill a critter out there in the field, <laughs> you know, and butcher it, and that that meat has to come in. And education's the key, and I think really with American energy and with our energy here, education, getting people out here, getting them to see for themselves really what it does, mm -hmm. is the key to getting the understanding that we need so that we can progress with what we have here. And I think the Moff people in Moffat County are willing to be educated on renewables too. Yeah. It just you can't overnight shut one off and go to a, another. But no. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we what time do you have to be home? We yeah. <laughs> thank you both very much. Oh, thank you.